All right, sorry for that. Good. So, uh, it's an honor to me to present you today the results of Testbed 16. It's um, at the same time, it's a very great challenge because I think Gobi allowed me roughly 90 minutes and we have more than a thousand pages of partly very dense research results that I need to integrate into these uh, just 90 minutes. Let's do our best. We can certainly not cover all details, um, but all details will be provided to you as part of the various uh, presentations that we will have throughout the full week. We already had yesterday the first presentations, for example, on GGGS, and um, others will follow today and with, over the next uh, upcoming days. This is a smart city, right? So this is at least a smart city without my glasses. And if we zoom in a little bit, we see it much sharper. With the glasses on top, I have activated my sensors, which are my eyes. And now I want to learn more about this smart city. So I want to learn which of these endless numbers of lights I can actually safely switch off. So I need to understand what do I have in the city? Where is in which room? Are there rooms that still have the lights on and do not have any people in there? Though I could switch them off. What do I need to do? Well, I need to bring data and processes together because without knowing where the light switches are, the data doesn't help me much because I cannot switch the lights off, right? So one of the very big challenges we addressed in Testbed 16 was exactly that, bringing data and processes closer together and then aligning them in a way that we can use them in a very convenient way. What does it mean? Well, we do have OGC API processes. Just in this context, if I just want to send a very simple request to some process, the connection between the processes and the collections, it's not very obvious with the API. It's not really convenient that I need to create a full JSON encode execution request and send this to the execution endpoint. This is different if I want to package a whole application into a container and then submit it to the cloud, right? This is not what we are talking about here. What we are talking about here is the situation where I just want to run a simple process um, on a environment that's usually now these days sits somewhere on the cloud. So we figured that OGC API processes is not really convenient to switch the lights off. So we developed something new. This something new is called the Data Access and Processing API, DAPA. Before we start into looking into DAPA, I would like to give you a little bit of background. But DAPA is um, nothing that we just came up for Testbed 16. DAPA is the result of a multi-year plan that we started with Testbed 13, where we looked for the first time at an Earth observation applications to the data architecture that allows us to package applications into containers, ship it to the physical location of the, um, the data and execute it there. So locally or local to the data to improve the performance of the process. And then you can request the results being delivered back to you. And Testbed 16 now developed DAPA because we said, well, we can package very complex applications, but what if I just want to um, submit a request to a specific process that is rather simple? Do I need this um, very powerful infrastructure and setup, or can I embed the functionality to do something actually directly in the API to make it easier for the user uh, to submit a request and make it easier just to have a uh, to use the entire API. So processing functions should become part of the API itself. A bit more background. This is a market, right? The market has lots of different fruits, so lots of different products that are offered to the customers. Our products look slightly different. Our customers are probably the same, buying the fruits but the products look a bit different. And what we are usually doing is we convert 
all the elements we find on the market and create a nice meal out of it. Sometimes this is very simple, like here, right? With um, three, four, what's not ingredients, we created a nice meal. Lots of different options to create a meal, lots of different techniques and mechanisms. Sometimes creating the meal is a hell of a lot of, of a complex process. So you need to line up your ingredients nicely and your tools, and then you need to bring it all together. Sometimes you don't care at all, right? Sometimes you're only interested in the final product and how it was produced is, um, uh, doesn't matter to you. All that matters is the end and final product. And uh, in tribute to Mark, I uh, used a pizza here as the final product. So let's con transfer this back to our Earth application architecture. What does it mean? Well, our developer here on the left-hand side that's the one who knows about the data on the cloud platform and the application developer has all the knowledge to do something with that data to produce higher value information out of it. The application developer packages or develops the application locally, packages everything in a Docker container and then ships the Docker container to the cloud platform. That is supported by a number of uh, processing services or these days OTC API processes. For sure, the application developer can use others, uh, other applications that are stored on the cloud already and embed them into complex workflows. So can even reuse what others have submitted. On the other side, we have the application consumer. The application consumer can go to the cloud platform, discover the application, provide all the input parameters that are required for by this application to run. And then after a while, the consumer can collect the products. That works. That was tested, developed and tested, um, well, developed the last three years, tested this year very intensively as part of the EOApps pilot. And now we said, okay, can we complement this with even, even simpler um, mechanisms and approaches? And here's what came out of it, DAPA, the Data Access and Processing API. First, DAPA couples the processes much more tightly to the data collection. So I know which data works with which process or which process can I apply to what data. It has a very simple invocation pattern. So I don't package a JSON element and then HTTP post it against some execution endpoint. No, instead, I use HTTP GET with a number of query parameters. So pretty much like calling a website. I can explore this very nicely with Jupyter Notebooks. And that's an important feature um, I will talk about more in a couple of minutes. We then did a little workshop with a number of scientists and we let them explore what we developed and uh, collected their feedback. We learned that we can use um, DAPA as a blueprint for other convenience APIs, for example, the Environmental Data Retrieval API. So DAPA is not necessarily an API that must go forward, but DARPA explored a number of mechanisms and approaches that we can then even apply to other elements like, for example, EDR. So that is answering the question, do we need DARPA, right? Or how many convenience APIs do we need and how do we avoid proliferation at the same time? The DAPA evaluation workshop I talked about uh, provided uh, very good feedback. First, they said DAPA is simple to learn. It provides a reasonable set of functionality and it's very simple to use and embed in Jupyter Notebooks. And that is very important to a large group of scientists. Some constructive feedback. Well, they um, would like to see an easy to use interface to learn how to use the API. So learning was an important topic that we have now taken into consideration for Tested 17. Um, they asked for richer metadata links to describe the collections, the query parameters, uh, example invocations, etc. So this is a very interesting aspect that comes back to the how to do things element that we um, are seeing in many places these days. So in traditional service-oriented architectures, the only link we got back was to some metadata and ideally, well, 
we got some quality information. But we never had links to examples how to do, how to apply an API. And these are elements now that we can more easily embed into the APIs and they are requested every day. And then a GDAL compatible data format and direct access to the GDAL virtual file system was requested. What future work do we have after we um, developed uh, the, the uh, DAPA in Testbed 16? Well, we need to talk more about output formats. We need to um, negotiate the various output formats. We need to have output structures like data cubes, coverages, time services, and so on, and defaults for these. We need to talk about new um, media types, additional query parameters. So there are um, quite a number of elements that we still need to add. Um, but overall, right. the experience was overall the experience was very very positive. We had with Stoppa. When we're looking at processing in general, what we see is that on the left hand side we have those very dedicated APIs. Uh, for example, for mapping, right? Mapping is such a generally important process that we do have a dedicated API. Routing is one of the next ones we will develop. Um, these APIs provide less flexibility. They are optimized for specific type of product, so maps or routes in this case. On the other side of the spectrum, we have OGC API processes that allows to deploy any process that I can think of, that I can invoke in a standardized way, um, that can run uh, over long periods of time, and I can still learn about my process and so on. So OGC API process is really the other end, fully flexible, very powerful. In between, we have these elements that we have just talked about, like environmental data retrieval, the DARPA platform, the ADES, which is the Application Deployment Execution Service. So this is a middle ground that encapsulates a set of functionalities which are required by a certain community um, for their easy to learn and easy to use APIs. And um, this is something we will need to look at uh, in more detail in the future because we are certainly currently finalizing OGC API processes. We will have more towards the left. So we are talking about the mapping API, the tiles API, and so on, uh, routing styles. But how many do we have in between? How many do we have that embed functionality, even processing functionality, and at the same time are still easy to use? And then bringing it all together, how do, you, how do we avoid a massive proliferation of APIs that would then um, negatively affect interoperability. What's next? Well, we need to continue the development of the libraries. We need to um, explore more the Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook clients. We will see that in a minute. Um, we need to elaborate and position DARPA with all the other elements, the standards, the building blocks we have. We need to talk about profiling. This is all in the context of how many APIs will we have. And um, if you're interested in getting all the details, there are two engineering reports, 2016, the OGC Testbed 16 DAPA Access and Processing Engineering Report, and OGC 20-25, which is the DAPA API specification, or well, the draft specification to be more precise. That's DAPA. Now let's switch to no Jupyter Notebooks. So the idea was we have the data architecture developed over the last couple of years that allows us to share functionality, to share applications with others. Within the scientific community, one of the um, uh, very promising elements and that are used very intensively these days are Jupyter Notebooks. This is a Jupyter Notebook, right? What you usually see is uh, just a browser window and this browser gives you some text and graphics. You can add any text or graphic as you like. You have code blocks. You can have any number of these code blocks. And the, the cool thing is that you can change the code within these code blocks, and then you can click the little execute button. The code is executed, and the results are immediately displayed um, 
in the same browser window. And for sure, you're not limited to whatever functionality in terms of mathematics, but you can use any processing, any processing um, API and visualization API as you like. Right, so here we see a leaflet map that um, is actually displaying a WMS layer. That's the way it works. You as a user sit in front of a browser. The browser communicates to the notebook server via HTTP request. The notebook server loads the notebook file. That is the thing we would like to share eventually. And the notebook server, whenever you, whenever you click the little execute button, um, calls a kernel, usually a local kernel to the notebook server, and the kernel then executes um, any sort of backend system. In most cases, it's a Python-based backend system. The server supports some multi-user um, elements, right? Some um, multi-user features, but there are limits to it. So what do you need to do when you are reaching these limits? Well, you can share Jupyter Notebook files with others, either in the supported with the supported functionality, or you put everything into a container, your entire environment, and there are convenient tools to do so. And then you have your Docker container with the uh, complete Jupyter environment, all the libraries, everything embedded, and you ship this, and then you can execute this. Um, on a remote in a remote environment. And for sure, there are further tools available that allow you to, for example, integrate an entire environment that you have um, stored in a Git repository and package this, right? That allows you to have very nice governance structures. You can update individual elements in your Git repository, and then you tall you tell your binder tool, hey, please package this um, now and deliver the Docker container with all the elements I need um, to a Docker Hub. So if we now look back at our applications and the architectures, before we had the application developer to the left, Dockerizing the application, putting it to the cloud via a WPS profile, which is called the Application Development and Exploitation Service, ADES. We can, as we have just seen, do the same thing now with the Jupyter environment. So we package the entire Jupyter environment, then for sure we will not make use of the graphical user interface that we have just seen. There is to Jupyter a command line option available, so we would use that command line option and then uh, submit the packaged container to the ADES, and then it's available on the very same cloud as all our other applications on top. Just this is good to share the entire environment, but what if we want to be more interactive? What if we want to have very interactive Jupyter notebooks in the cloud shared with others? So we can um, at the same time have multiple copies, we can have multiple variations, we can experiment with them, we can use Jupyter notebooks delivered or submitted to the cloud by other users and embed them into our own workflows. So what we will have at the end is pretty much an interactive like Google Earth engine in every cloud. And that is a fantastic goal of, of, this, uh, of this testbed 16 and uh, further future work. It's really that we now have the full spectrum. We can package a very complex application that requires tons of user input to run the application. We package this. Uh, put it in a Docker container and submit it to the cloud. We can have a Jupyter notebook, um, package it, submit it to the cloud, or we can have the Jupyter notebook as an interactive environment directly part of the cloud. And with these elements, we have a very complementary set of functionalities. We can have the complex ones, the mid-complex ones, where I still need to submit a query um, down to um, operations that just require a call to a specific endpoint without uh, 
any parameters or maybe just an, an area of interest and a time window. What's next? Well, we need to explore Jupyter Notebooks more in, uh, in more real-world scenarios. And then we need to develop some best practices. We have just started to develop a best practice for the Earth, of, uh, Earth observation applications to the data architecture. So the Jupyter best practice will follow next. Um, we need to elaborate a bit the descriptions of the application packages, which describe um, the elements that are embedded in such an application. Um, we need to advance the standard specification for these things. And um, yeah, so we are we're not fully there yet, but we already see a, a extremely rich set of options to share an application that is developed by one person with another person without these two ever seeing each other. So it's a full decouple of the application provider side and the application consumer side, which is fantastic because this opens a complete new market. Whereas before I developed my application for my employer and my application was somewhere embedded into a rich processing engine that most likely was running on a server somewhere in the basement. Now I package my application, make it available on a application store, pretty much like the iStore or the, the Google App Store. And this application immediately becomes available to everyone. So that then um, allows complete new markets to be developed because people can, or developers can be reimbursed for the work whenever the application is called on the cloud. So what do we have now? We have DARPA as a convenient API to access the data. We have Project Jupyter, and we have complemented with Project Jupyter the EO applications architecture. So we now have a very convenient way to use existing or add new light switches slash processes, right? We do have the processes available. We can use them. We can directly add new ones that all works. The question now is, well, how do you know what we are actually working with? Which brings us to a new journey, and that is a journey of analysis-ready data. There's a starting point. The starting point um, we used in Testbed 16 was the definition provided by CIOS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, and they defined ARD for a specific domain. So they call it CARD4L, that is analysis-ready data for land. And their definition reads, satellite data that have been processed to a minimum set of requirements and organized into a form that allows immediate analysis with a minimum of additional user effort and interoperability, both through time and with other data sets. And that means that ARD is basically a specification of what happened to the data before it reached its endpoint. What is our goal? Well, our goal is that ARD enables the analyst to use any data source. So we don't want to limit necessarily to satellite data. We want to make it a broad um, functional specification. And we want to create ARD specs that allow this. And what do we need to do? Uh, what do we need to do? What do we need to know to do so? First, we need to understand what analytic tasks the analysts are actually doing. Once we understand what they are doing, we need to know what information they need to perform those tasks. And then we can check, okay, what data sources do we have available that meet the information needs? And the ARD specification then brings these two needs to uh, these two elements together, the needs by the analyst with the available data. So we have a document that clearly specifies the mapping between the two so that the analyst can be sure that this is the right data to run a specific analyst uh, analytic task on. What did we do? Well, first, we generalized the concept, right? We have seen CIOS defined it for satellite data. We have now generalized the concept in testbed 16. We checked for any implications on the OGC baseline. We um, explored what um, links and um, relationships 
this has to aspects like data cubes or Docker packages um, and how they can um, use ARD to their advantage. We need to create a set of ARD specifications. That's um, one of the key outcomes. And then at the moment, we are talking pretty much about static elements, right? Um, data is constantly produced, available somewhere at an interface, and um, that's about it. In future, if we think more about publish subscribe patterns and very dynamic sit um, um, situations and very dynamic processing environments, we need to then enable the dynamic aspects of ARD much more. There are two elements to readiness. So analysis ready data. Um, one is content readiness. That's the focus on the data. And we have technical readiness. That's the focus on the access to the data. So one is data, one is the process or the API. Let's look at content readiness. You are content ready when you fulfill uh, these five requirements. First, you represent one or more physical variables. You have your data georeferenced in a common CRS. Um, your data is homogeneous and comparable in time. It's flagged with quality information and wrong or missing data. And the process of creation is fully documented. So if you have these five elements, um, you can claim content readiness for your data. And then we have the technical readiness. And this is for sure the end of the spectrum again, right? Ideally, the data is available in a cloud-free way. So I have a call to, in our case now, an HTTP endpoint. And if that data is actually stored on a single cloud, distributed over 20 different clouds, or distributed over a collection of in-house data, cloud data, and some other sources, should not matter. The data should be available continuously over space and evenly distributed in time. And then we want to have on-demand products and processing that is supported by the infrastructure. And if we do have all these elements in place, well, we can claim technical readiness. So the goals, a single computing environment, so at the moment, what we see is we have all those common technologies, but most of the platforms pretty much work in isolation. The ARD concepts allow to define a federation that can bring all these elements together. So if we do have all our applications on the various cloud platforms with the various data sets, ARD can be like an abstraction layer around it and allows me to see all these parts and components as a single computing environment. In this context, we can um, leverage the data cube metaphor quite a bit. And, and that is one of the key goals here, it allows us to minimize the data transports because we know which parts in the federation can provide exactly the amount of data that is consumed and required by a specific process and only submit this element or this part if the process cannot travel actually to the data itself. The issue with ARD at the moment is that there are different um, elements of the definition, right? So we have the CART 4L um, ARD definition, the remote sensing products that have been geometrically and radiometrically corrected and have some metadata to it. We have homogeneous ARD, uh, we have ARD platforms, and all these elements are used by the various players and market participants. And what we see here is we need to consolidate this uh, situation because otherwise it's a little bit hard to understand who is actually talking about what. Standardization, we need to have ARD specifications, that's um, clear. Um, CIOS has provided a very good um, groundwork, so an intensified CIOS OGC collaboration is certainly a very interesting option. One of the lead CIOS Card4L developers was part of Testbed 16, so this was established, but just for the testbed, so we now need to continue this very intensive um, work into the future. Semantics, um, well, we need to assign a URI to each type of ARD 
and we need to host these somewhere that they are accessible to everyone. So the OGC definition server would certainly be a natural um, first choice. That is so important because the more data we use from disparate data sources, the more we run the risk of having incompatible um, data without necessarily noticing it because there might be the same identifier used for two completely different things. And yeah, last element, the exploration of the event-driven ARD. That's certainly one of the next items. All the details, again, available in OGC Testbed 16, Analysis Ready Data Engineering Report, which goes by the number 2041. Oh, here it comes, twice. Okay, ARD, uh, pretty abstract. Do we have an example? Yes, we do. Well, this is a digital motion imagery. It's a video stream. And this video stream has embedded detections. So the uh, little red crosses we see here with this ship and these other two elements, um, whatever these are. The thing is, these are detections detected by an apparatus that is trained to detect, um, in this case, vessels and other elements on sea. These are not features. We can accumulate these detections over time, right? So we have all those individual detections, and then we can build tracks. But these tracks are still not features. So how do we get from full motion video or full motion imagery or digital motion imagery, however you want to call it, to moving features? Well, we do have platforms that identify and extract moving objects from the imagery. And these are the Video Moving Target Indicators, VMTI. And they are passed along um, in the MPEG-2 transport stream. And what we can then do is we can build a conurbational picture. But unfortunately, this uses features. And VMTI is not a feature yet. So we need to describe the process of detection to feature, which is fully aligned with this idea that ARD describes what happened to the data before it was made available as um, the element it represents at the endpoint. We have a standard for moving features, that's OGC moving features, and um, these are features with a geometry and they move, so they change location over time. Well, great. Um, we figured that OGC moving features is adequate as an interpretable format to communicate tracks that were extracted from the VMTI um, standard, but we identified some limitations. And we saw that ONM is quite an uh, interesting alternative option, but that requires further investigation. So we used moving features as a product a feature product that is available at an endpoint that was undergoing a series of steps before it was made available as a moving feature. And there are lots of elements that you need to describe in this process. Otherwise, you can't know if really all moving features have been detected, how the tracks were um, generated, um, did you have lots of false positives originally, and so the um, the set might not be complete. All these elements are extremely important, and we have now demonstrated that ARD works for satellite as it works for other types of data. Details in the full motion video to moving features engineer report 2036. This will be, by the way, continued very intensively in testbed 17. So in testbed 17, we have two ingestion services. They provide their uh, detections to a storage. The storage gets a new API, the Moving Features API. And then we have a tracker service that uses the individual detections plus the little tracklets, so very short tracks, and tries to combine them to longer tracks. And again, make these data sets available at the Moving Features API. And then we have two different types of clients to um, evaluate what was produced by the, the uh, various components. So this is certainly something that is um, now continued. Okay, 
we have DARPA, Convenient API, we have Project Jupyter, we now know that we can um, generalize analysis-ready data to any type of data. We have seen that this works for example for moving features from detections, but what do we do um, with ARD across clouds and what's about offline containers, right? So offline containers, Geo package is number one offline container in OGC. Originally, it was developed as an open standards-based platform for transferring and using geospatial information in a very compact, self-describing and portable format. So I have my Geo package, um, I can take it with me, I can use it offline, I can um, update the content and one spec um, at home and one spec with um, a stable connection. I can even synchronize my updated Geo package with the original data store. And we tested quite a number of these situations in previous test beds. We, as well, identified a number of limitations. So one was that at the moment, it is very difficult to understand what's actually in a geo package. So there was limited discovery of geospatial content that is in the geo package. Then there was a lack of standard uh, ability to share portrayal information. So that includes both the styles and the symbols. You can put them into the geo package, but there was no clear way of how to link them to the data. And we, it um, has been reported that there is some poor performance when loading and processing very large geo packages uh, or geo package vector data sets in the client software. So, testbed 16. Well, first, we improved interoperability through better metadata. So, the metadata and the linkages between the metadata and the, the various data sets allows us now to much more efficiently understand what's in a geo package. You don't need to look into um, so many tables as you did before. And we improved the performance of extremely large geo packages. And now it's not the, the format itself, it's, it's no longer the limit, right? It's, um, it's really the size of the data set. And um, we will see a number of aspects that we can do to optimize performance. And for sure, we looked at the portrayal information as well. So what did we do? For the discovery, well, we now have metadata profiles. We designed them in the context of the Ordnance Survey Master Map and the OS Zoom stack. We um, developed a style extension, well, the style extension that was uh, developed before is now fully embedded with semantic annotation um, so that we can link layers to styles. And we um, explored the performance. So we used a uh, zipped file from the OS master map. This uh, top topography data set is in a zip way, roughly 50 gigabytes of size. And if you decompress or uncompress it, you have a geo package file size of roughly 235 gigabytes. And then we explored various strategies to improve performance. The first one was strings to characters. Well, you can reduce the file size um, by, you, by um, replacing all the strings either with integers or with single characters. That is the first um, mechanism to bring down the file size. The second one is segmentation. So the scale of the master map uh, goes up to one to 4,000. We can now split a geo package into a smaller set of geo packages with one master geo package. The master geo package provides all the spatial index information and the portrayal information. And then you just select the geo package that you need for your very specific data request. Because at a, at a scale from one to 4,000, I mean, you are at a rather local scale, and if you do have entire UK in your geo package, most of the time you try to select a tiny little bit of data in, from a very, very large um, overall set. So using this uh, pyramidic 
approach allows you to have one master file with the index and then you jump to the specific geo package to actually load your data. Geometries. Geometry encodings um, take most of the space and we um, checked a, a number of alternatives. And at the end, all of them have been discarded. So flat geobuff, tiny, uh, WKB, Topo JSON, MVT, they were all um, considered. None of them promised to give us a performance boost. So at the end, that's why they have been discarded. Sorting is another very important element. And that is the control, uh, the controlling of records or the layout of the records. Um, on, first of all, first your index and second your hard disk. So the sorting, as we can see on the left hand side here, if you have an index that is unsorted versus an index that is sorted, uh, the overlap is quite different. So we experiment with a geo hash and inserted the features in the sorted order into the geo package and that gave a quite substantial performance boost. For sure, if you look at the uh, the images in the middle, this is more important for spinning disks than it is for um, SSDs. But still, even with SSDs, given the um, the package size you usually read per read operation, it still gives you some increased performance. And then the last item is generalization. So you add a number of generalization tables. Well, that first increases the overall geo package size. But in return, you experience a huge performance boost. So for the data at a scale of 1 to 40,000, that was a 2 to 8 time better performance. But it went up to 300 times better performance at a very um, small scale of 1 to 200,000. So if you're interested in uh, getting a nice present for Christmas, um, you may want to ask for OGC Testbed 16 Geo Package Engineering Report. This is 2019. It is delivered in time for Christmas. It is packaged nicely and it gives you some pretty cool and detailed results. I just sorry need to close my door here because it gets a bit chilly in here so now we have um, looked at ARD we delivered an example moving features from detections we investigate the offline usage but ooh, if I do have analysis ready data across clouds and even in offline scenarios the question is how secure is this actually? Well, security by camouflage is probably not the best approach we can imagine. Still, your data travels more and more, right? And the data might be used in an environment and in a way that we don't even think about it these days. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to make sure, first of all, that the data is capable of protecting itself. So this is what we refer to as data-centric security. The data remains encrypted and is only um, decryptable by those people that have the right key, plus the key still needs to be valid and so on. You still have the hackers. So what did we experiment with in Testbed 16? Well, first OGC APIs need to support security classification and data protection. If I, for example, have a data container that includes encrypted parts and non-encrypted parts that give me a hint of um, what type of key do I need, where can I obtain the key, um, what are the classification labels, all these elements need to be supported, not necessarily by the course, but by um, extension elements to the various OGC APIs. We experimented with both data streaming and offline usage and figured that it can be supported. Uh, encodings and container formats need to have, um, need to see more work. So we have all those metadata elements plus the encrypted portions. We tested in um, Testbed 16 with uh, Stanex and Jose. But support for additional media types is, uh, is required. 
And we did first tests with a dedicated key management service for creating, registering and invalidating the cryptographic keys. And uh, in testbed 16, we used an OASIS specification, but that turned out to be, well, a bit problematic if we need to scale quite a lot to um, lots of keys for lots of different data items. So that's why we go into testbed 17 with uh, the requirement to develop a dedicated OGC API for keys. And this is, again, part of a process, right? In testbed 15, we started with the data-centric security essentials. So we looked at the protection, so how to encrypt various parts, how can we label it with the um, different classifiers, um, which is basically a metadata element to the data. We looked at policy enforcements um, that worked on spatial and temporal attributes. So for example, you're only allowed to see the content of this file if you are uh, in a certain region at a certain point in time. In testbed 16, we advanced these elements. Now we have JSON encodings for responses before we worked um, due to the Stanex uh, with XML. We have now a dedicated key management server, but we know that we need to develop it further. And we have content negotiation with new media, media types. In testbed 17, now we need to integrate the data-centric security with the federated security. Plus, we need to extend from OGC API features, which we have used uh, in testbed 15 and 16, to additional resource types. And we wanna look at the binary types, um, in particular maps, styles, coverages, but even geo packages. And as I said before, we will develop a dedicated key management service API. And then what's next in testbed 18? Well. Let's see. A second part in testbed um, 16 looked at federated security. So here we uh, investigated federated security a bit from the what's similar to media types uh, or to multimedia contents, right? So this is the digital rights management that um, we discussed about, when was it, 15 years ago in OTC very intensively. I mean, Allow your neighbor to use your Netflix account is one thing. It's probably built in at the the quotes you get at Netflix. Allowing your neighbor to see your secret data is no option at all, right? So we are certainly uh, we we certainly do have similarities to multimedia and other contents, but our requirements are different, and that's what's uh, investigated in the Federated Security Engineering Report. We do have an element on how to protect data analytics in a federation of clouds. So a single cloud, um, that's what we understand pretty well. A federation of clouds is a different story. But with, I mean, security is changing so dramatically these days because there is not a firewall to your then protected infrastructure anymore. Your data resides somewhere in a cloud. Your data travels very far, um, sometimes, without you fully understanding all the possible implications. So data-centric security was even looked um, at from the federation perspective in this report. We analyzed quite a number of threats. So um, that is based on previous work by NIST and IEEE. We check the security and trust requirements, uh, trust or lack of trust, and we will go into a zero trust uh, requirement for testbed 17. Some adoption strategies, near-term to long-term TARS to achieve trust and security in federated clouds. To some extent, there is always a trust relationship required if you want to build something. Um, starting from zero trust is usually a good starting point. The question is always when to introduce what level of trust so that you can build a system that you can actually work with in a convenient way. So testbed 17 will examine the integrated DCS federated security. So that's pretty cool because that's the first time now that we integrate both perspectives into a single task. Results available in two engineering reports, 2021, which is the data-centric security engineering report, and 2027, which is the federated security engineering report. 
Good. Now we have, well, we can take our data with us and we can secure it. Let's look at link data. And we do this in the context of aviation. So link data and semantic registries for system-wide information management. If you look at aviation, well, we do have the SWIM feeds, right? SWIM feeds are designed by independent data providers. Um, they are delivered by standalone services, and these are um, published in the National Airspace System um, and Service Re Registry or Repository, the NSRR. Just the SWIM services use a plethora of taxonomies, ontologies, vocabularies. I mean, they have emerged over time. And as a result from um, seeing all these services coming online. Real world situations just often require data from more than a single swim service feed. And then interability is, um, well, eventually dependent on strong semantics. That's certainly something we need to look at. We did so over the last couple of years several times and we are better and better understanding the implications, the potential, but unfortunately the huge effort that needs to be undertaken to get to a fully semantic sound system. At the same time we look at the API modernization, so solutions that complement the current SWIM services and link data, right? Querying accessing SWIM data using semantic web technologies. Here is some um, the setup we developed testbed 16 don't go into all the details here just want to highlight a couple of elements we do have the swim service providers these are the existing swim services they deliver their data the swim data the orange bubble here um, using the java messaging service and these we now want to make available by a data relay so for our swim data though so this is our testbed 16 backend that is then connected to a SWIM data client. So Java messages um, or Java message service elements come in at a very high frequency and they are delivered to our data client via the REST API. Couple of questions. Well, first, JMS are not directly well mappable to the features that we use at our REST endpoints. The message itself is not necessarily a feature. The message itself may contain several features or references to several features. Um, there's temporal information that is sometimes relative to very specific points in time. There are issues with um, unique identifiers that are not necessarily all unique. We have location that is delivered at the three-letter airport code only. Um, which then gets us into trouble if we want to run spatial operations. At the same time, we have, um, well, over a trillion of messages every day. So it's terabytes of SWIM messages that are delivered to the poor data relay API service every day, how to deal with this enormous amount of data. Some lessons learned from the client perspective. Well, um, we discovered a number of issues with uh, GeoJSON. We figured that GraphQL is a very powerful um, approach that allows us to do um, queries that would be very, well, that would require a number or a sequence of REST calls. On the other hand, these GraphQL queries can become quickly uh, a bit complex. From the API perspective, wonderful API features for SWIM was very easy to use. That was, or is, by the way, a feedback that we received in several tasks. So the APIs are really easy to set up and can be used almost instantaneously. That's really great feedback. On the semantic side, well, the semantic registry um, was extended with a GraphQL API and a linked data serialization. We use JSON-LD, Turtle, RDF, uh, and XML, and, and triples. And we had a triple builder in triple store. So the triple builder um, generated two sets of triples for this testbed, one for flight data and another one for airport data. Um, a third set of triples was generated by combining these two sets then. So the idea was, okay, how can we link different elements together? 
we learned a hell of a lot of um, aspects in this context. First, the ontologies that are available only work to a specific extent. We developed for that reason six <laughs> new ontologies. They are not complete, but they are good starting points. And we, we saw that this definitely requires additional work in future. It is a very powerful concept. It allows you to discover services and connections between SIM services that you can otherwise um, not discover using the um, web client to the registry that is operated at the moment. But there are lots of lessons learned and um, here are a few more. Well, one key element, and that is if we want to do the full transition from where we stand right now to linked data, then we have to acknowledge that this is a very expensive process. And what we definitely need to do is we need to demonstrate the value of linked data. And in order to do so at a reasonable um, well, investment of resources, it's probably a good idea to develop best practices to make OGC, API, um, OGC APIs supporting linked data in a flexible way already so that we don't need to look at this part of the equation. We need an OGC API um, for SWIM. So the API works very well, but what is a feature based on an incoming message, right? I mean, what, what is the mapping between the messages and the features? And given that the feature services with their REST endpoints need to store all the incoming um, messages from the original swim service well having this relay function didn't really work out very well so the idea was okay we need to equip our swim services with native support for the various um, feature functions that we provide lack of ontologies well semantic enrichment requires converting geospatial data into rdf triples under, and here's a key, well-defined ontological schemas. And well, we figured that we could develop initial ontologies, but the ontology design definitely requires more subject experts and will need to be uh, crafted very, very carefully in order to fully exploit the um, inferencing mechanisms that are supported by linked data in general. And um, one aspect, side aspect, but that directly went into uh, additional requirements for GeoSparkle is there's no ontology for moving features at the moment. And um, well, that is something that should be added and it's already in discussion, well, as I said, in the context of GeoSparkle. Results available in 2020, that is the Testbed 16 Aviation Engineering Report. Okay, here we go. So this is um, seven, I think out of 11, I don't even remember the number. But now let's ask, if we think about semantics and linked data, and we think about RESTful interfaces to what was previous, a publish subscribe pattern based Java messaging service, we think this, you know, we think the, the access and discovery of services and elements in a very different way. Can we think, location differently brings us to discrete global grid systems what did we do well we looked at a ggs library so what is needed from a ggs library and we introduced quite a bit of terminology that was necessary because we figured at the beginning of the testbed 16 that we had quite a number of um, not really matching definitions of what and DGGS is, what DGGS data is, what an API is, what the library actually should do. So one key concept is the DGGS provider and the DGGS navigator. So providers support single or multiple reference systems, whereas the navigators support all the topological queries. That's an important aspect that helped us once it was clearly defined at the beginning. The next question is, 
DGGS data. So here's a little a little poll. Um, is there such a thing as DGGS data? You can answer this for yourself. And I'll give you a little bit of a pro and con. On the one side, you would say, no, there's no DGS data. I mean, there's no WGS84 data or UTM3 data, right? Um, traditional systems are independent of the choice of the spatial data format. So you have data that uses or is exp the, um, the uh, geometries are expressed using WGS84 or UTM3 or any other um, system. But you can you can store the data at the at the GeoJSON um, file. You can store it in a shape file. You can store it in the geo package. I mean, there are lots of different mechanisms. Well, this is a clear no. On the other side, you have a clear yes, and that is because DGS reference systems define their own geometry. So the geometry is implied by the zone ID, which means it's an identifier. And the zone ID then has a very specific geometry that is either the, uh, the centroid of this little zone or the boundary of the zone. So it's the DGGS reference systems navigator function that make these identifiers spatial, which means if DGGS reference systems define their own geometry, then there is such a thing as GGS data. This is certainly a discussion which is not fully completed yet, and I all invite you to use the next Remo session to debate if DGGS data is, is actually a first-class citizen. A couple of other elements uh, addressed in Testbed 16. One was, well, we checked a number of existing libraries, so we've reviewed um, the open source libraries uh, Uber H3 and Monarchy's Venua's RealPix. Uh, we defined a number of use cases and explored them in conjunction with Jupyter Notebooks again. And we did some mapping. And that's a really cool thing about Testbed 16. We started DGGS fully independent of DAPA because when we added DGGS to the call for participation, it was um, way after we finished the DAPA descriptions. And at the end, we figured we, um, we explored a DAPA API mapped onto a DGGS OTC API processes. So the, the tasks, the independent tasks, decided to use each other's work, and that was a fantastic new experience. Results. First, from the implementation side, well, services present DGGS reference systems as collection of virtual vector layers. So each layer is an item in the collection, and each layer corresponds to a level of the DGGS reference system grid hierarchy. So basically to a zoom level, if you want. Um, the data itself um, was uh, serialized as GeoJSON. Then the coordinates have been created on the fly. So by um, mapping the zone um, ID to its real world coordinates or as JSON, and then we just delivered the zone IDs. OGC API processes played an important role because we used GeoServer, equipped it with the OGC API for processes, and immediately had the full capabilities of GeoServer available. We had a single wrapper library that was created for both H3 and RealPix. We had a NoSQL database uh, in the, the background, and that proved to be super fast for um, both Sentinel-2 uh, native data as well as statistics and index calculations like NDVI on top of it. And the DGS zone ID was the primary index for the Sentinel-2 pixels. Then we used OGC API features and implemented a linked data approach with RDF data. That was very successful, directly um, created some um, additional inputs for the GeoSparkle revision. We used the vector data set from Australia's uh, level one statistical match blocks and hydrological catchments, and we converted them into GGGS RDF data, and we used the cell ID as a predicate. Um, that worked like a charm as well. Um, the OGC API features endpoint presented the data at either JSON LD, then again with the uh, the zone ID, or with GeoJSON, and then we provided the uh, the geometries again. So that was a very, very um, positive and extremely uh, rich task that proved 
the versatility of the GGS systems. So the participants delivered both native GGS vector information and EO capabilities to, on the one side, traditional GIS clients by delivering GeoJSON, and on the other side, to native GGGS clients that work directly with a cell ID. So that was um, that was really an, an impressive piece of work. Next steps. Well, we need to mature the DGS reference library implementation that was done. We need to elaborate OGC APIs for G GGS, sorry for the typo here. Um, at the moment, we, uh, we did the tests and we were happy how quickly we could um, establish, uh, equip even um, very established technologies with DGS support. That needs to be further explored in the context of the other OGC APIs or emerging APIs. We need to explore and, and um, the, the opportunities and the limitations of DGGS-driven analytics. We need to understand better where the exact values are, and these are different for all the different use cases and, and communities. But once you understand the value of it, it is really impressive. And we need to do some um, OGC registry implementations for the various uh, DGS implementation data services out there. Results? in 2039, which is the DGGS and DGGS API engineering report. Okay, now that we have thought location differently, can we think standards development differently? So what do we talk about? This is model-driven architecture for OGC APIs. The idea is that you do have a UML model the UML model is a profile of the Open API meta model, a profile for your specific um, service type, like features, processes, tiles, maps. And you have this UML model available. You can use the UML model to um, build basically the platform independent um, definition. And then you have a tool, and we use shape change very successfully in this task, to generate the platform specific, in this case, Open API version 3, JSON encoded, um, serialization of it. So it's a three step process that we have to implement. First, we have to build a UML model for Open API. Open API, the uh, specification does not have any UML model coming with it. So we need to create one that includes all the relationships and constraints and attributes and classes um, that um, Open API features. That was a hell of a lot of work. Then we need to build a specialization of that. So in this case, we had the Open API meta model and we uh, used it to describe our OGC API features. And um, this UML model was then fed into the open source tool ShapeChange to execute the transformation. So um, in goes UML, out comes open API in JSON. Results. Well, the project demonstrated that the model-driven architecture approach works, though it was complex. Plaques. If you look at, I mean, this is a real screenshot from the UML model. Uh, I think this is for collections, not that you can really read this, but the UML models tend to be very, very, very complex. On the other side, at the moment, Open API is the only transformation target. We use Open API very intensively. But the question is, shouldn't there be a separation between the standard and an encoding? I mean, given that we put at the moment lots of our domain knowledge into the open API part, we capture knowledge as part of an encoding. And yes, we invest so heavily in open API at the moment, but what if another approach becomes more suitable in future? What if open API is replaced by the next technology in one, two, three years? The UML models would survive. We would just adapt the transformation engine to serialize these models then in a different um, encoding format. But the entire knowledge would be captured in this abstract representation. On the other side, the price is the complexity. And um, the question is, 
do we, whenever a new um, mechanism comes around the corner, do we just adapt all the specifications like we do now with Open API? Um, or do we really invest into um, substantial UML models that uh, might be quite difficult to maintain and govern? So questions um, that could go into another round of Remo debates during the breaks. Results in uh, 2033, which is the Open API Engineering Report. And now, big buzzword missing, words about machine learning. So we analyze machine learning in the context of wildfires. So one word is about fuel load estimation and the other one was about water body identification. Two key aspects. One is there is a very, very limited um, set of training data available. And the training data that, that is, or the training data that is available is hard to discover. And with training data, I mean here the annotated Earth observation data, right? So um, basically um, original data together with the labeled set that allows me to train a model and then to, um, well, basically use a part of it to test my um, uh, the quality of my model, or I need some additional uh, ground proofing. And then the interoperability challenges, challenges with all those different data sources and live streams we have from the variety of systems and the non-continuous variables that we need to play with. So what did we do? First, we looked at the discovery and the usability of data to train our models. Then we deployed the models behind OGC API instances. We made the models discoverable by um, registering them in a catalog. This requires a metadata model. We executed machine learning models. So um, we facetted them with OGC APIs or service instances of OGC um, APIs and uh, figure that, well, we definitely need a standard way to store and reuse models um, in future. Then, once executed, we looked at the, the publication of the results, um, the visualization, um, in including uh, a map ML representation. And then the question is, well, how can we make decisions based on machine learning data? That is something that we need to look at uh, in more detail in future, and it's about data authenticity to a large extent. But let's look at all the findings of um, the machine learning task. First, the available, available services. We uh, use the catalog, uh, data access services, data processing services, and they all facilitate the modular deployment of machine learning um, processing chain. So the, the, the general setup works. Right, the general setup with the separation between catalogs and data processing services and data accessing services, that works. It scales well, good foundation to integrate machine learning models into our standards-based infrastructures. Um, from the old WSTAR-S to the new OGC APIs, works. That was uh, a clear message. For the old WMSs, well, we need to make sure that the, the legends are actually machine readable. This is often not the case. And then it is hard to use a WMS map, which is an image um, being displayed uh, for to train a machine learning module because you don't necessarily know what you're looking at. OGC API tiles prove to be a very good candidate for model training as um, both the value data sets as well as the label data sets can be retrieved. API records on the other side offers necessary levels of flexibility uh, to store and reference, uh, not to store, but to reference our training data sets. We have ADES and EMS, so mechanisms, profiles of uh, process endpoints that provide robust interfaces for model deployment and execution. So that's the long link back to the beginning where we said we can easily package any application into a Docker container and ship it to the cloud, works. We need to work, uh, we need to have further work on the meta model. So the meta model for machine learning models and training data sets, right? These 
include things like, uh, well, what is the objective of the model itself? What is the learning algorithm? What is the optimizer function? What is the data set metadata? And so on. So we need to have a full um, metadata model for training data and machine learning. Data authenticity is a very big topic. Um, well, you want to ensure that models are trained with authentic data because you may take um, expensive decisions based on the outcome of a model. And then there are elements like ARD and uh, Onyx. Um, Onyx is the Open Neural Network Exchange. Uh, that's a community very busy that would allow us to uh, capture versions and exchange versions of models uh, more elegantly. In terms of ARD, we need to think about AI-ready data. So when is data actually ready for um, model training? Um, that is certainly when it comes with training data and well, these additional elements that need to feed into the meta model. Results available in two engineering reports. One is um, a general machine learning ER that is 2015, and then we have 2018 that is the machine learning engineering report that focuses on the training data. So with nine minutes to go, here's the summary. We looked at a hell of a lot of items. It was a fantastic endeavor, I have to say. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, everything is about data analytics and how to optimize data so that we can make good decisions based on the data that we can that we can drive the data um, way up the value chain from very raw data up to very high level um, knowledge. We looked at DARPA as a convenience interface that even includes a number of processing elements. We developed a specific API. Um, for it. We looked at Project Jupiter because it is such a hot topic in particular in the scientific community and it allows very nicely to learn how things work because you can explore the source code right in your browser, you can execute it, you immediately see the results, you can um, modify the source code. So that is certainly a tool we could um, further think of in terms of uh, making it even easier um, to use our APIs. We looked at ARD to give it all and kind of an envelope to really understand, well, what data can be used in which way. We explored it in the context of moving, moving features. We looked at geopackage containers uh, for offline data, figured what we need to do in terms of protecting data and protecting data across federations, so data-centric and federated security. We looked at semantics in the context of aviation with linked data, explored the potentials of model-driven architecture, and last not least, investigated the machine learning capability. This time, less focus on the actual quality of the models, but with focus on training data. Last slide, most important one. Thank you very much to all our sponsors. So NGA, Natural Resources Canada, NASA, ESA, FAA, UK, DSTL. Without your contribution, this would not have been possible. So a very big uh, thank you from our side. A big thank you from my side to the whole Testbed uh, 16 team on the innovation program, Josh, Scott, and Greg. And um, I don't have pictures, but um, I mean, there's, Many more involved in the testbed. These are just the ones um, who executed the testbed at the end, but there are many, many more people on OGC staff that uh, supported the testbed in a wonderful way to make all this research happen. And with these words, I thank all of you for participating this morning or afternoon um, in this future direction sessions. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, so if you have any specific questions, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, please check the agendas for the various working group sessions. There are lots and lots of presentations um, all over this week that um, have some links to Testbed 16. And if you haven't read it yet, the Testbed 17 call for participation is out there. It's ogc.org slash testbed17. Figure it out. Uh, lots of things are continued from this testbed into the next one. A couple of new topics are added. and um, yeah, it's, it's certainly an exciting um, research endeavor that we have just in front of us. Thank you very much. Go be back to you.